All right, now let's actually look at DFSP. I've mentioned it a bunch, and now let's actually talk about uh, some, some real examples of DFSP. The classic clinical history is a multinodular fungating mass on the trunk of a young adult, but it's important to note that they are not always on the trunk. They can be on the extremities, and they can uh, be uh, relatively common, actually, on the scalp or the face, unfortunately, a, a significant subset. Uh, occur there. I'm in a, um, a couple of DFSP patient support groups on Facebook that are organized and run by patients, and I've been volunteering there for the past oh, eight years or so, and it's been a truly life-changing experience. I, I volunteer in a variety of rare cancer um, and rare disease uh, Facebook patient groups, and I've got a chance to meet a lot of really wonderful people, and I've learned so much from them about, especially about how their DFSP presented. And one of the things they did, like an impromptu poll in the group, not for research purposes, but just to see, and it asked the patients, uh, the, the, the founder of the group, she asked the other patients, you know, where have your DFSPs occurred? And I think in their survey of several hundred people, about 20% were on the head, head and neck. So, uh, and of course, very problematic in that location, often results in huge surgery and, and a lot of morbidity from treatment. And occasionally can be even weird places like the hands and feet. Anogenital regions, another place that a subset of them occur and often, you know, really a terrible place for the patient's sake because of the morbidity involved in the surgical removal. So the other thing to keep in mind is that, of course, the classic ones described in history are not multinodular and fungating. And if you leave them alone for many years, that will probably happen to many of the DFSPs. But early on, they often are either flat or a nonspecific skin colored uh, nodule. And so because of that, they mimic cyst or lipoma, occasionally dermatofibroma. The flat ones tend to get misdiagnosed clinically as scar. And we actually did a real um, uh, survey study uh, with members of that patient, the DFSP patient group uh, as co-authors with us. And we published that in uh, JAMA uh, Open a couple of years ago. Um, and um, I should have put a link in here, but if you, uh, if you look up my name and DFSP, and Facebook, uh, it'll probably pop up on, um, on PubMed. And uh, so we actually did a survey and found that many of the patients that had misdiagnosis, a lot of times these were the leading clinical uh, diagnoses in the differential before the lesion was biopsied. Cyst, scar, lipoma were the most uh, common of those three. And the ones that look like that tend to get delay in diagnosis, at least in our study. And so as you guys know, the, the spindle cells in DFSP should be bland. They do not have pleomorphism or, a, or significant atypia. Very rare to see pleomorphism in DFSP, and it's rare to see necrosis or atypical mitosis. It actually looks more benign morphologically a DFSP looks more benign than a DF. It's paradoxical. You would think that it should look more atypical, but this is because these are translocation sarcomas, okay? And so most translocation or gene fusion related soft tissue tumors, benign or malignant, they tend to be uniform and monotonous cells. All the cells have the same molecular abnormality, so all the cells look just like their neighbors, okay? They, uh, uh, aneuploidy is what gives rise to pleomorphism oftentimes, although you can see pleomorphism in other things that are benign. But in, in general, uh, most translocation and gene fusion tumors have uniform monotonous cells and do not have pleomorphism. There are some exceptions, but, but I think that's a general useful, very useful rule in soft tissue pathology. CD34 is very sensitive for DFSP, but it's not specific, okay? It, it can be negative in uh, fibrosarcomatous DFSP, and I think sometimes also in myxoid DFSPs. I've seen a really dramatically myxoid DFSP that was CD34 negative, and, um, and, so, and I've heard from others that that can happen sometimes. So I don't do molecular regularly, uh, only in difficult cases, particularly when I have a partial biopsy. But if you need to, uh, the most common gene fusion is collagen 1A1 PDGFB. Uh, when I forgot, the new way to annotate fusions is to put a double colon mark, not a hyphen, but uh, I'm, I'm still stuck in my old ways, so I forgot to change that. But the, we now know, uh, as of a few years ago, uh, it was discovered that a subset of DFSPs that are negative for the col one a one PDGFB fusion actually have a translocation with a variant uh, uh, partner, PDGFD, D as in Delta. And so PDGFD can be fused with a couple of different partner genes. And so if you are worried about DFSP and you fish for call one a one PDGFB and it's negative, if you're able to, I like to reflexively fish to PDGFD. All right, here's the classic story form pattern, and it's kind of a tighter story form pattern than the one I showed you in the dermatofibroma, but certainly they can be similar sometimes. 
They're very bland, uniform, thin, stretched out spindle cells, no pleomorphism with the rarest of exceptions. I have, I think, seen precisely one DFSP with pleomorphism and it had been previously radiated. It was a recurrence post-radiation or, or else they, I think they pre-op radiated and then removed the mass. That's what it was. And so I think that the radiation may have contributed to the pleomorphism in that case. There's also a, a case report published from some authors in Spain, if I recall, a few years back that showed uh, a DFSP that transformed into a high grade pleomorphic, like looked like undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. I was shocked by that, but they had molecular evidence and proved it. If I just had that, I would never in my wildest dreams have imagined a DFSP, but they had um, a molecular proof. So it can happen, but it's really, really, really rare. All right, this is the classic honeycomb entrapment. The DFSP invades the fat and eventually replaces most of it, leaving behind only scattered individual adipocytes or little tiny crushed islands. And look, there's no fat necrosis at all. It's a very clean entrapment of the fat as opposed to the kind of messier, dirtier entrapment that we saw in the dermatofibromas earlier. And the other thing is that, you know, this probably is not the only fat trapping. This all, everything in this screen is used to be subcutis and it's all been filled up with DFSP and only a little bit of fat is left behind. So we often are thinking that we should be seeing infiltrative, you know, tentacles of tumor invading the fat, but oftentimes what we'll see in DFSP is that there's only a scattered stranded islands of fat in the middle of solid tumor. But if you look at the adjacent skin or go look for eccrine coils to see where the dermal sub-Q junction is, you're going to see that what you thought was all tumor with only a little bit of invasion of fat is actually all tumor that's completely replaced the subcutis. So I remember when I first saw that, I was really surprised because the edges looked relatively smooth um, and not infill and, and that's because the entire fat has been replaced and infiltrated. So it can kind of give you this, uh, this false impression that, oh, look, there's only a little fat trapping at the bottom. But no, all of it's been replaced. And then here's more, uh, more classic kind of honeycombing in, a, in an area where the subcutis has not been filled up yet with, um, with tumor. And that's the CD34 that you want to see in DFSP, this strong, diffuse, blazing positive expression in the tumor, okay? And now here is an example where you can see classic honeycomb pattern, trapping of fat and conventional DFSP at the side. And then in this sharp cutoff, there's a, a big nodule here of hypercellularity. And as we go closer, those, uh, the uh, cellularity uh, is showing this herringbone uh, fascicular pattern. It's making fascicles that are cellular and that are intersecting at acute angles and giving you that, that herringbone or chevron pattern. The cells are bigger, they're more plump, they have more mitoses usually uh, than the uh, thinner cells of conventional DFSP, but they're still usually not pleomorphic. They are bigger and more atypical, but uniformly so, at least in my experience. And so this is what we, what we want to see for fibrosarcomatous transformation. And occasionally I'll see some DFSPs that have areas that are cellular and, and they seem a bit more than regular DFSP, but they don't quite make the herringbone pattern. So I've occasionally had to use some comments in my report that there's an area of increased cellularity that, that could potentially represent early fibrosarcomatous change, but I'm, it's not definitive, basically. I don't know if that's right or not, but I've just seen some that I felt were too much for regular DFSP, but didn't quite get here. And I don't feel like there's like a, a, great, uh, a great answer for what to do with those cases, but I, I have encountered a few like that before. So, so if you've seen something like that, I, I have as well. All right, so let's stop and talk before we end this, uh, this part of the lecture. Let's talk just for a second about fibrosarcoma, all right? I know this is more of a deep soft tissue thing, but it comes up and I think there's still a lot of confusion. This is a historic term for sarcomas that had a herringbone fascicular pattern of spindle cells, okay? If you look back in the early 1900s, historically fibrosarcoma was like the most common type of sarcoma in soft tissue pathology. But now it is vanishingly rare and most of the things that were called fibrosarcoma in the past, if you, you work them up with modern techniques, uh, including immunohistochemistry and molecular, we find that most of them end up being something else, okay? DDF liposarc, synovial sarcoma monophasic type, cellular schwannoma, cellular fibrocysteocytoma or cellular DF, et cetera, et cetera, okay? 
I've seen melanoma with herringbone pattern even. So uh, most things that have the herringbone pattern are not fibrosarcoma. So my recommendation, oh, sorry, I had a slide for that. So there's some, the same thing I just told you. So, you know, in the WHO bone and soft tissue patho uh, tumor book, adult type fibrosarcoma is still listed as an entity. So, I mean, by the book, it still technically exists, but I'll tell you this, if it exists, it is vanishingly rare and it's a diagnosis I have personally never made. In 10 years of practice as a soft tissue pathologist, I have never called something fibrosarcoma NOS or adult type fibrosarcoma. So uh, I've seen other people more expert than me do it, but for me, I feel like I'd rather just say spindle sar cell sarcoma, undifferentiated spindle cell sarcoma or something like that if I really can't tell because I just feel like uh, it's so vanishingly rare that if you make this diagnosis, you're usually statistically you're gonna be wrong. Okay, that's my viewpoint at least. So here's the times that in modern soft tissue pathology, these are times that it's okay to call something fibrosarcoma, okay? Fibrosarcoma is DFSP, like we just saw, or some people use the term fibrosarcoma arising in DFSP. That's kind of an alternative nomenclature. And that's what we just looked at in the last case. Infantile fibrosarcoma, which is a sarcoma that looks herringbone pattern and is cellular. And it's in infants, and it is a translocation uh, sarcoma that has a, a gene fusion of ETV6 and TREC3. So it's a very specific, molecularly defined uh, tumor in babies, that's quite rare, but has a very good prognosis, so it's important to diagnose it um, appropriately and correctly. And then also, of course, if fibrosarcoma is part of a proper specific tumor name, right, myxofibrosarcoma or sclerosing epithelial fibrosarcoma, these are not descriptive terms, they are actually proper names for a specific type of tumor um, that probably, uh, neither of which is related to, you know, the, this uh, so-called adult type fibrosarcoma, okay? Sclerosing epithelial fibrosarcoma is probably on a, spectrum or at least somehow closely related to, to a low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. And mix of fibrosarcoma is more like a kind of a myxoid variant of undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma or, or something along those lines. So to me, in my opinion, if it's not one of those three things, I basically don't use the term fibrosarcoma. That would be my advice to you, but I'll let you decide if you want to take it or leave it. And I'm going to stop right there. Oh, actually, maybe we have just, maybe I'll be only one or two minutes late. Uh, Giant cell fibroblastoma is a pediatric variant of DFSP, usually in kids, but adults can have it too, oftentimes mixed with conventional DFSP. And um, it's treated the same way that, that it's basically just a morphologic variant of DFSP. To my knowledge, there have not been any reported metastases, but it may just be that it's so rare that, you know, maybe eventually this will be described, but it's, it's relatively quite rarer than, than traditional conventional DFSP. But to my knowledge, no reported metastases yet in this, in, in pure giant cell fibroblastoma that I'm aware of. And this is what it looks like. It's very mixoid and hypocellular. It has these large... Um, cystic spaces that are basically pseudovascular spaces. They're kind of an artifactual space, it seems. They often have these multinucleated cells that look a little bit like hyperchromatic pleomorphic cells at first, but at a closer look, they're usually actually multinucleated or multilobated nuclei that are just mimicking pleomorphism from low power. And they tend to uh, aggregate around the cystic spaces sometimes. We're not really seeing that here. There is a mixoid background and it's very sparse and hypocellular. Here's another example with nice Nice, nice pseudovascular uh, spaces, hypocellular spindle cells, mixoid change, and those multinucleated kind of stellate looking cells. Here, the multinucleated stellate like cells are lining up along the edge of these spaces. And they could give you, if you're having a bad day, you could get the false impression that this is a, a true vascular channel lined by atypical cells when in fact it's not. And uh, there's a closer look at these multinucleated tumor giant cells. So I tell you what, anytime I see a spindle cell tumor with mixoid change and I start seeing multinucleated cells or cells that are kind of triangle shaped even, uh, which is kind of like the precursor to the multinucleated cells is they start looking kind of uh, triangle or stellate shaped and then eventually become multinucleated. At least that's what it seems like to me. I use that as a clue for myxoid DFSP because myxoid DFSP has a lot of overlap with giant cell fibroblastoma type DFSP, okay? And in fact, I, I feel like you can, you can see areas of giant cell fibroblastoma that transform into conventional DFSP, but oftentimes there's some myxoid change in the background. So I feel like the more, the more of uh, when a DFSP has uh, giant cell fibroblastoma-like areas, it tends to also have a lot of myxoid change. So myxoid DFSPs, I think, have a lot of overlap with these. And so if I see any cells that look like that, I start thinking about myxoid DFSP, all right? And again, it doesn't matter what name you give. These are all DFSP. 
Um, but that's the, the things we just talked about. Again, you can do the fusion. I am not aware of a PDGFD fusion yet being described in this variant, but I imagine it's just a matter of time and eventually someone will, will report it. But that's still a pretty new and is uh, only, you know, maybe 25 or so cases, I can't remember the exact number, of PDGFD fusion DFSP that have been reported. So I imagine it's just a matter of time before one of these gets reported uh, with a PDGFD. But that's just my, my theory. Okay, I think we will stop there and we'll come back for part two at the next lecture and start with fibrous hamartoma of infancy. Thanks very much and I'll see you then.